Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 3, Acts the third chapter. When you find it, say amen. amen. Are you comfortable? <laughs> Acts the third chapter. One day, it starts out, one day. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. They had that Tuesday night prayer meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. At 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple. Being carried to the temple. Gate called Beautiful. Where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. Everybody say, look at us. Look say it again. Look One scripture says, look up. Look up. Change your perspective. I can tell you this much about if you've had any time in life, a lot of people that beg don't want to look you in the eye. They just ask for whatever it is that you have in need. Peter looked straight at them and said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Now let me just stop here just a minute. You're going to find out in this message, this guy has been lame for 40 years. And he's been laid, they carried him, and they laid him by the temple gate. He, according to what I'm reading here, he's never really made it inside. But now that he's well, he's following Peter and John on inside. He's entering into the place of, of worship and, and praise. As a matter of fact, he's bringing his own praise with him. Did you hear me? I said he brought his own praise with him. When you come into the house, bring your praise with you. Don't wait to get here to start praising. Bring it with you. Amen. That's a good thing to do. And praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, rise. Father, I thank you for the word. Lord, let my lips speak that which you put in my heart. I thank you for this word. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to speak to great people and glorify your name in East Harris County. I thank you for this area, that you be Lord and be lifted up around all over this place, that people would know that you are Lord and King. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The 40 years, he's 40. Now, I don't know at what time they started bringing him, if he'd been doing it for 20 years, 30 years, but he was very familiar. The people were familiar with him, and they would bring him there, and they would set him out at the gate, and there he would beg. It was his only way. Uh, so, things are so different today. Even though we might see people that do, you know, at times they do beg. As a rule, this day, they did not have wheelchairs. They did not have, a, 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 what's the word for a, a disability? You know, a, a, a American disability something. Yeah, that's it. They didn't have that. So this guy was literally left to be by himself, to be, be, to be set down and hang out. And, and, and if I can move toward this, let me just back up just a little bit. I, I want to talk to you that there's a stagnation that will always be a frustration whenever you get stagnant, whenever you quit moving, whenever you're just locked into one place. Did you know that God made you to move? Everybody say, God made me to move. Everything that God created moves. Everything. I mean, I go back into Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, verse 1 and verse, uh, verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved. Everybody say moved. Moved upon the face of the waters. When God does something, when he, when he created grass, grass moves. I got to cut it every week now. Amen. It moves. Trees move. It just keeps right on growing. Did you know that the earth, when God created the earth, he put it into a, 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 a spiral movement? The earth moves a thousand miles per hour. Be still. 
Right now, we are moving. Somebody said, I didn't know I ever went that fast. <laughs> You're moving 1,000 miles per hour. And Katie and I were talking about it this morning, Pastor Mike, and we said, how do they know? And, and so we were talking back here in the back room, and, and we figured that when, when they took that little, little spaceship out of space, they brought one of them, uh, uh, Tony said they probably brought one of them little uh, police razors and shot it at the earth, and it said 1,038 miles an hour. Amen. 1,038, it's moving 1,038. Now, here's a wild thing. Last year, 2020, the earth broke 28 records. Let's give the earth a hand. Come on. Let's give the earth a hand. Last year the earth broke 28 records in speed. It moved faster last year 28 times more than it ever has in the history of known man that we know of. You know what that means? God was getting us past 2020 faster than, we, than, than you ever imagined. He said, you know what, I'm tired of y'all being there too. <laughs> so he sped the earth up because when God says move, everybody say move. Amen. God moves. He will move it. I, you know, I was born with this thing called muscular dystrophy. I'm, I'm in defiance of it. have been for a long time. But the thing that I find very hard when I wake up in the morning is moving. It's hard to move. I got, got to get up. I got to snap, crackle, and pop. Man, I'm moving. I'm snapping things. Uh, I'm working on, a, on, on, on some stuff right now that's causing <sighs> muscular soreness. <laughs> And I, and I, but I, I know that the only answer for it is to keep moving. If you watch me worship, I, 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 I realized this last week. I realized when I'm worship, I don't know if this is offensive to anyone, but I'm actually shifting my hips a little. I hope that doesn't bother you, especially you old Elvis fans. But I can't help myself. It's just naturally that if I don't move, I'm going to stove up. Y'all know what the word stove for me just is like stovepipe. It just becomes stiff, you know, and rigid. So I got to keep moving. So when God started, start. I always said that Genesis 1, 0, in the beginning, God started, start. Now, I can't prove that. You can't disprove it. But God got start started. How many know that? Amen. He got it rolling. He got everything moving. So the earth was always moving. He said, snails, I want you to move. And the snails started moving. He told a turtle to move. And the turtle just stuck out his head and put it back in. Amen. It started moving a little bit. Then animals moved. And the water moved. And the water's never quit moving. The, 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 the moon's pulling on it. The water keeps on churning. You've never been to the ocean when the water was still. You thought it was, but it wasn't. It's always moving. It's always turning. Amen. Man moves. Women move. Amen. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Amen. There's something about moving. Two-thirds of God's name is go. God's always moving. Can I get an amen? Amen. He has a propensity, man does, to get stuck. When we do this, we get stuck. We, we get moving in life, you know, 40 hours a week. We come home, we eat, we go to bed, we get up and do it again, and we just start this. And God has this way of coming into your life and challenging you. And, and I thought to myself, where I'm at right now at 60 years of age, that here I am working again, to me, hard for me. But we've been through two floods. We've had to rebuild stuff. We've, we've, we've remodeled this church. You know, my whole life has been about moving. And moving is an important part of life. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the whole reason Jesus came to earth, it's like, it was like <laughs> that Father, Son, Holy Ghost, if I can use this, we're looking down at the balcony of heaven and look down at man and said, you know what? Day stuff. They stuck. They down there every year sacrificing a sheep. They down there every year asking us to forgive them of their foolishness and sin. They stuck. And then they, they had a meeting among themselves, a little Baptist board meeting. And uh, the father said, well, one of y'all got to go down there and get them boys unstuck. Jesus looked over to the Holy Ghost and said, well, you're the one always moving. Why don't you go? And he said, well, I'll go after you. <laughs> Jesus said, all right, I'll go. And he jumped out of the balcony of heaven and right into the womb of a little 15-year-old, 16-year-old girl, virgin girl. And all of a sudden, she started walking around, and she's pregnant. She, she don't know who to tell. Who are you going to tell you're pregnant when you never had relations with a man? She feels her stomach swell, and the angel done told up, said to her, that which is inside you is of God. Amen. You're carrying Emmanuel, amen, the Christ child. And she starts swelling up. She runs over. Who are you going to talk to? I tell you who you talk to. You go and find somebody else that's pregnant. 
Amen. So she found her cousin Elizabeth. She shows up. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, pregnant with John. When they get together, you know what happened. The scripture says when the two bellies got together, both of them babies started jumping. Amen. She said, what happened? Something just moved up inside me. You know why he came to earth? To get you moving again. To get you unstuck. Amen. To keep you moving from this place to that place. Many times in life, we just kind of go through the routines of life. you got to have that broke up. you got to stop it. So in this story, it's a story of mankind. Man was stuck from birth. You don't have to teach a child to be stuck. You know, kids, you don't have to teach a kid to lie. You ain't got to. Amen. You don't have to teach a kid to be selfish. You ain't even got to teach adults to be selfish, you toilet paper hoarding people. People just selfish, man. It's just a part of us. And it's so hard to get unstuck. And we're hoarders. And hallelujah. And, and it was self-centered. And many times we're mean. And God came to get, unstick us. And Adam and Eve got stuck. And Jesus came to earth. Amen. To get them moving again. And then here the scripture says in verse 1 of what chapter 3 we just read. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now let me help you. If you've heard me preach any time at all, then you know there's a difference in Peter and John. Yeah. Right? Last week I told you Peter, Jesus told Peter how he was going to die. He told Peter, he said, one day when you're old, they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. Until then, don't worry about it. That's why when he was in prison and he knew he was going to lose his head the next day, he was sleeping because he knew that God was going to take care of him. He wasn't old yet. But after that was said to, to Peter, Peter said what to Jesus? What about John? Amen. John is the one who says that he loved Jesus more than anyone else. This is where I get this idea that I am the favorite of the Father. And whoever favors the Father, the Father he will favor. Say it with me. Whoever favors the Father, the Father he will favor. Amen. Who's your favorite? I want to tell you, i got five kids. The one that's favoring me is my favorite. <laughs> that's, that's Katie right now. It's a true story. You can act like it's not, but the truth of the matter is you're going to favor the one that's favoring you. But why? Because life ain't fair. It just ain't fair. They say, go, well, why don't you do something for me? Because you ain't doing nothing for me. <laughs> you're not taking care of my interests. You don't care about what I'm doing. You're doing your own thing. Amen. But John, John, John said, I had my head on his chest. Mm -hmm. Amen. I was there in the garden. I was there when Jairus' daughter had died. I was there. Have you noticed that, guys? Have y'all noticed that every time Jesus went somewhere, he took me? You know why? Because I'm his favorite. Amen. And then there's Peter, who, by the way, was also there. He could claim that he was favorite, but Peter's different. Peter is there. Mm. You know, John has his head on the chest of Jesus. Peter got his feet in his mouth. They, talk, they two totally opposite cats. Amen. And this hits me about the church of God. Many times in life, we want to be, you fish, David. David, you go fishing. James, you go fishing. And you say, well, today I'm going to fish for bass. And you use that bait to get bass. And next thing you know, you got a sheep head on there. Or you got an old catfish hard head. Or you guys, you didn't want fishing for that. And I know a lot of churches, they just fish for this certain group. I have found that if you're hungry, you'll bite anything. Amen. You'll get catfish and, and swordfish and hard-headed fish. Amen. Just like the 153 fish of last week, right? You get HD fish. You just get fish. So, so, so here's Peter and John. And the word I would like to use to use is the word collaboration. When odd things work together, and this is God's church to me. It's, it's the white collar and the blue collar. It's, it's the north and the south. It's ethnicities. It's, it's different races. It's just everything. About, it's just so different. And I love when different folk can make things happen. Can you get an amen? Amen. Because I look at these, these guys, they're just an absolute contradiction. You remember in Matthew 18, 21, Peter had an issue with forgiveness. Then came Peter to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Uh, can I, how about seven times? It was Peter that come up with seven. You know why Peter come up with seven? Because on that day, I believe he had already forgiven seven times. And he was hoping that Jesus would stop at seven. That way he could punch one of the disciples, probably John. <laughs> right? So Jesus said unto him, I say unto you, not, not, not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. 490 times. In other words, I want you to, be, I want you to live a life of forgiveness. 
I want you to live a life of letting things roll off your back. Amen. Quit letting folk live rent-free in your brain. Hallelujah. Amen. Let, break away from that. Let forgiveness flow out of your life. So their temperaments were opposite. John's soft and kind. John showed his love for Jesus. Amen. Peter's rough and spontaneous. When Peter showed his love for Jesus, he cut off a man's ear. Yeah, I just That's my kind of friend, you know. Amen. Somebody had cut an ear off for me. I like that. Amen. They're walking contradiction. Peter's Facebook, John's Instagram. I mean, this is different. So the first miracle of the church was two men who were opposites agreeing that what we need to do is go pray. And they're on their way. And on their way, John probably had compassion by noticing the man. Shoot, Peter probably just stepped right there. In, well, as soon as he saw the situation, he stepped right into it. Acts chapter 3 says, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple. He was dropped off in the church's parking lot every day. Amen. What about the people who dropped him off? There's one thing I've learned about human nature. We don't like doing something for nothing. Especially the ungenerated heart. Many of you have been born again. You'll do things because you know that what you do here matters there. And it, for whatever time you are kind here, cha-ching goes off up there. But down here, the ungenerated heart doesn't want to do anything for anyone unless there's a reciprocation or something coming back. So if I got to take you every morning and drop you off and you're going to collect, then when we get done, I'm going to collect from you. So they would drop him off. And you could just see this kind of life. He'd get picked up, hold out my cup, go home. Next day, get picked up, hold out my cup, go home. Next day, get picked up, hold out my cup, go home. Stuck. 40 years. Get picked up, hold out my cup, go home. And nothing is changing. What you going to do today? Oh, I think I'm going to sit right here. What y'all going to do? Well, I'm going to sit right here too. Amen. And this was their lifestyle. And then Peter and John came by. I, 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 I told pastor this morning, my pastor, you know, I talk to him every Sunday morning. And I said, one of the things I see in the word of God, and it's predominant, is that there are people that take advantage of people's disadvantage, disabilities, and addictions. And they make money on them. The women who mourned when Jairus' daughter died were getting paid for mourning. That's what they did. They were professional mourners. Therefore, when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, they lost their money. Uh-huh. Amen. I, I, was a, I started drinking. My first beer, I was six years old. Six years old, I drank my first Slitz malt liquor. Amen. It was in a metal can. You couldn't crush it. Uh-huh. Amen. Some of y'all have no idea what I'm talking about. But I remember it, just vivid. And since then, and I would sneak and I would drink out of my dad's cabinets. And, and then me and the guys, we knew about bootleggers. And we didn't wait till we were 16 till we started driving. If you're up here on Wheeler Mountain, you're driving 12, 13, 14 years of age. You're driving something. Amen. You pull up the bootlegger and you know how to do it. My family were bootleggers. Amen. So I started drinking when I was young. And so I would, I would drink and I'd drink all the way up until I got born again. Did you know when I got born again, those who made money off of me lost their money? Do you know when I quit smoking, people who made their money on me lost their money? Amen. Now, listen, and I, and I know that they're, they're advice. I'm not picking on you about your beer. I ain't picking on you about your cigarettes. Amen. I don't need to. The Holy Ghost does that. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Let the Holy Ghost be the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Ben, you're wearing a roll tide shirt. Thank you, sir. I just noticed that. I feel Jesus in the house right there. Come on, Jesus. Amen. We need a Peter and John to lift us rather than a Larry and a Mo to drop us off. Amen. Can I get an amen? Because there's always somebody that wants to drop you off so they can make some money off you. I need somebody that's got something inside them just a little bit stronger. And after 40 years, it all changed in one day. The cycle broke. Everybody say the cycle broke. When you break the cycle of always just mundane over and over and over, and that thing breaks, it is a great day. Let me tell you, the men who were making money on him, they lost their money. Hey, can you imagine when they went out to pick him up and they saw him walking? 
And they say, oh, my God, we just lost our money off this boy. We've been dropping him off every day. Well, i tell you who got mad. They got mad at Peter and John. The religious groups got mad at Peter and John. Everybody was getting, the, the people that were making money on him got mad. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for a handout. Peter, with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye, said, look here. He looked up, and he was expecting to get something from them. What happened was he had adjusted his expectations to his limitations. That's when I saw you ride that motorcycle, sir. What's your first name again? Derek. Don't let me forget that, Derek. Amen. When I saw you riding the motor, I didn't even know you had a prosthetic. We ain't even talked, all right, until you walked out of here last Sunday and got on that bike. When I saw you get on that bike, I said, come on, Jesus. There's a man that you know, the others say, hey, what's he doing on a motorcycle? He got a prosthetic. Amen. Listen, I know some guys with good legs that shouldn't be on bikes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Rode with him. Hallelujah. But here it is. He adjusted his expectations to his limitations. And many times in life we do that. If God can get our attention, amen, he can exceed our expectations. He always has in my life, if he can just get your attention. He downgraded his dream to fit his reality. He was expecting money. This is all I've ever expected. If I could just get some money, I can part it out, give it to these guys. He didn't even think he could get unstuck, but he got legs. I've often said the man asked for alms. That's the New Testament, the, the King James word. He alms, alms for the poor. He asked for alms and he got legs. Amen. Sometimes you ask for one thing, you get another. Can I get Amen. So his greatest miracle was on the other. Some of y'all ain't never going to get that. Amen. His greatest miracle was on the other side of his biggest disappointment. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That's why I'm watching the miracle of our, our bass player who should have died three times over. Amen. Has come back and watching him start talking again and walking again. Hey Amen. I, I just said, and I'm amazed. I'm amazed at what God does. But here, Peter said, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have. Can I tell you, has it, has it, have we watered down our Jesus over the last 2,000 years? Have we, the confession of a believer, for a believer to say, Christ in me, the hope of glory, have we watered down our Jesus so much? And I'm just not, I'm not trying to, to be preachy. I'm trying to be honest with you. Have we watered down our Jesus so much that when we see people that are hurt or, or, or disadvantaged or disabled or addicted, that we don't have enough inside of us to pray for them or believe God for the best for them or to see miracles for them? Amen. And the issue is pretty simple. I can pass on by you and go into the temple and pray for you. Or I can stop right here and pray for you and we can believe God for the best and maybe I have to accept the verdict that you may not get healed on this time but maybe somebody else will come along and pray for you and you will even though I don't get the attention at least God gets the glory amen so let me be the one that will stop by here and pray with you and believe God for you and one day it all changed everybody say it all changed his self esteem changed amen when he got up he was eyeball to eyeball the scripture says he praised God he didn't praise Peter. He didn't praise John. He praised God. He understood where it came from. And he began to give praise to them. Amen. And it was an amazing thing that Peter said to him, silver, gold, I don't have. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, began to walk, and he went with them into the temple, walking, jumping, praising God, walking and jumping. Hallelujah. I love that. God's grace allowed those who saw him stuck now praising God. And oftentimes, I, I do, I sit back and I just wait. I think, you know what? If somebody breaks loose in here, we're going to have revival. Some folk are so quiet, if they just lift their hands, if I can hear their voice, amen, something's going to happen up in this house. Can I get an amen? Well, here's the, that doesn't stop there. You think, okay, that's the end. No, it's not the end. Keep going, keep going. Ver, chapter 4, verse 1. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees. Do y'all know about them Sadducees? You know about them? See, the, the, there were Pharisees. They believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> I'm so much better than what y'all are thinking right now because y'all need <laughs> Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John arrested them because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. They're overnight in jail now. So here's Peter and John in jail together. I'd have loved to have been there. 
in jail with them. They listened to the conversation. Let's see what they're talking about. But many who heard about the message believed. So the number of men in, who believed grew to about 5,000. So while we in jail, 5,000 men plus women and children out there believing. This thing could take it off like wildfire. See, I still believe. I still believe, Lord. I still believe this can happen today. Amen. And it, it may not take a, that kind of a miracle, but somehow, some way that people begin to catch it and start believing. Amen. Start believing. And then verse 7 says, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Tell us how you did it. I want to know. This man, 40 years, 40 years he'd been lame, and now he's walking. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. You remember what I told you about the Holy Ghost moving? Amen. So, so Jesus done got there, done resurrected, and then chapter 2 of Acts, whew, here come the Holy Spirit. He moved in. Always keeping us moving. Always keeping us moving. You know, there are people in church sometimes that are, that are frustrating. I know that. With pastor two churches. And there are certain people I know when they come to church, you go, oh, my God, they're here again. <laughs> they're going to come talk to me. You watch them. They're going to come talk to me. They're going to say something to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I heard this years ago that when they used to haul salmon in them giant tanker trucks from Alaska down to the, uh, North America, they would often put catfish in the tank with them because if the salmon quit moving, they'd die. But the catfish kept bumping and aggravating the salmon. And every now and then in the church world, God puts a couple of catfishes up in here, <laughs> amen, to aggravate you and to bump you and to keep you moving so you don't stagnate and die. Can I get an amen? I don't know. That came from way back in the years ago. I don't know how true that is. Somebody may have to look that up. If it's not true, don't say it because I'm going to preach it in the next service. <laughs> so here it is. They bring them in. By what power, amen, he do this. That Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people. Rulers and elders. Let me, let me say this about Peter. He was smart enough to understand their position. I've often said this about uh, life. I may not like your personality, but I need to honor your position. You hear me? I don't like Joe Biden, but I do like the presidency of the United States. You follow me? Therefore, I pray for him. I, I didn't like my principal in high school. He, he whooped me. Some of y'all got spanked. I got whooped. Amen. But I respected his personality. I, mean, I respected his, his position. Same way with police officers. You may not always like certain police officers. And there's 800,000 police officers in America. And all of a sudden, two or three have a bad, do something wrong, and we throw all of them under the bus. They're not all bad. Amen. So you got to quit thinking this way. Hallelujah. But I honor their position because they have the authority to put me in an incarcerated place. Uh-huh. Like they did Peter and John. So Peter and John comes out, and he speaks to them. He calls them rulers and elders. He said, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, if that's the reason why we're here, then know this. I love this. You're talking about boldness. This is what the Holy Ghost does to you. Yeah, I, I see. I know, I know speaking in tongues and, and, and being spirit-filled and, 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 and gifts. But one of the, two of the major things about knowing you're filled with the Spirit is boldness and love. You love the unlovable, and you're bolder than you've ever been. You speak the truth in love. Amen. So then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Watch this. Whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Let me give God some glory here. I'm telling you, you crucified Jesus. God raised him from the dead. And that's the reason and the name in which he stands. Jesus is the stone, verse 11. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. Now, I don't know a lot about building, but I do know this. It starts at a stone. It starts in a cornerstone. And if the cornerstone's not there, the rest of the building's not going to be square. It's got to start with a stone. The cornerstone, he's the cornerstone, amen, in which you reject it, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. So what he's saying is you rejected the cornerstone. You rejected salvation. You rejected healing. You rejected peace. You rejected joy. You rejected love. You rejected all of this, amen. 
said, it is found in no one else but him. And here's that word that it hits me. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. That is an exclusive, offensive phrase today. Because we want to believe that there's any other way I can get to heaven. Is there, would you want to go to heaven any other way than the one who died for you? That resurrected for you? Is there some other way to heaven? Is this so hard? To believe, I get offended with people that try to find other ways. Well, I'm going to work my way to heaven. I'm going to ride a bicycle and witness to everybody I meet before I go to heaven. I got to do this to get to heaven. I got to give this much money to get to heaven. I got to go to the priest to get to heaven. That's offensive to me. Come on. What's right to me is to say, Jesus is the only way and the only name to get to heaven. Amen. Amen. That's why I'm fanatic about him. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a freak about Jesus. Amen. Because I want people to understand. Don't be so offended. Amen. With, with people. Um, no, quit that, Jerry. Sometimes I, I think before I talk. I'm aware of that. And I know that I can not say things because I thought them first. And I want you to know that just be, well, I thought it, so I said it. No. Just because you thought it, God gave you the ability to think something before you say it. So right now your pastor's pausing before I say something very offensive. To not heads. <laughs> I love Pete. I love what he does here. Amen. He lays it out. He just tells him straight up. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's a powerful exclusive statement in the world of inclusion today when everything is in included. Our government right now is trying to include every religion and everybody. Notice these are the religious people that are against Peter and John. Religion has always been against Jesus because Jesus gives freedom. Religion brings bondage. Keep reading preacher. Thank you. Verse 13. They couldn't take their eyes off them. Peter and John standing there so confident, so sure of themselves, their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in Scripture or formal education. They recognized them, though, as companions who'd been with Jesus. Let me ask you this. Would you rather have six years in seminary or three years in relationship with Jesus? Give me three years with Jesus, running with the master. Amen. They were untrained. They were unschooled. Many times people will put themselves down because I don't have the education. Or I don't have this. I don't have that. All you got to have is some time with Jesus. If you got time with Jesus, it takes away all the rest of this nonsense. Gonna get there. Matter of fact, most folks that go through cemetery, I mean seminary, often come out to be deadheads when it comes to loving Jesus. They recognize him as companions. But with the right, with, but with the right, the man right before them, the miracle standing there, seeing him standing there so upright, so healed, they could not say anything against that. They sent them out of the room. Come on up, uh, Joseph. Amen. I'm, I'm way too far here. Amen. They sent them out of the room. Oh, where was I? Thank you. And they sent them out of the room so they could work out a plan. They talked it over. So they spent a night in jail. Now they get kicked out of the room. They don't know what's going So that it doesn't go any further. This is what they said. Let's silence them with threats so they won't dare to use Jesus' name ever again with anyone. I worked for R.C. Cola back in the day as a young believer. They came to me and uh, kindly rebuked me and said to me, if we catch you praying with the Pepsi guy again, uh, you're probably going to get fired. You need to quit bringing that Bible to work with you. I can always carry my little leather New Testament in my back pocket and leave it sticking halfway out so folk could see. I was a fireball then. And I remind myself of my first love. How much... How many miracles? I, you know, I got that job at RC because I prayed for it. And everybody else, there was, I don't know, over 100 applications, six people got the job. I got it. It was during a hard time in North Alabama. So I, I gave God praise. 
I worked for a security company in San Antonio when I was in college. I shared the gospel while I was there. I can't, you know, can I be honest with you? There's ways to share the gospel with people without pushing them away. First off, it's your life. Let your life speak. And then second, eventually ask God to give you an open door to talk to them. And they'll, they'll open up. I was out on a security job one time and inside of a, a fence in the area where they had, were building these uh, apartment buildings for cliff dwellers. You know them cliff dwellers that live in apartments? And, uh, inside a fence. And a young boy named Cody, I'll never forget it. I was told a shotgun. And I was, I was, I'd act like I was playing SWAT. You know, I'd, I'd run from building to building, look out, and you know, I got a shotgun with me. Well, these roofers stayed the night. Because they, they, they would come in, they get up in the morning, they'd roof in buildings, and they'd go to there. So they sleep in their car. So I, I met them when I got there the day before and the next day. So I just walked up to the car. They were there, and I, I looked at that young boy, Cody, and, man, something came over me, and I said, you don't know God, do you, Cody? He said, no, sir. And uh, he said, I just, I've been, I don't know anything about Jesus. And I began to share Jesus with him. And the guy who was with him was a backslid believer. And he kept looking at, across the car at me and going. And I realized how it was affecting him too. And I shared with Cody about Jesus. And Cody gave his life to Christ there in that fenced-in area inside that car with me holding my shotgun. <laughs> you don't read into this. But I remember I wrote his name down. And I put it in my wallet. Because there have been times in my life where I just kind of got stuck. And God would remind me through names like Cody and names like friends that I'd led to Christ and things that I've done. He would remind me, nah, you can't stay that way. You got to stay at it. Do you know why we're doing Biker Sunday on May 30th? Because I felt like our church was starting to get stuck. Pastor, what do you mean? Do we need, yeah, I think we need to reach, I think that it's important for us to honor those who gave their lives for your freedom and my freedom to stand here and preach the gospel. I think it's important for us to have a day where we as a church step back and honor the first responders and those that are in the military to remind our people that you can be a patriot and love Jesus. Amen. I think it's important to do that. It, it, it unsticks us. We will have church here that day too, by the way. We're going to have church here and we'll have church out there. So just don't, don't think it's not going to. It's going to happen here also. But we'll have the bikes out there because that's the facility we have for that and the food. But I read this story. What can we do with these men? By now it's known all over town that a miracle has occurred and that they are behind it. There is no way we can refute that. Verse 17. But that it doesn't go any further. Let's silence them with threats. So they won't dare to use the name of Jesus again. Verse 18. They called them back and warned them that they were on no account ever again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John spoke right back. Whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you. Rather than to God, you decide. As for us, you know what Peter just said to them? You do you. You do you. But we're going to do us. We're going to tell you right now. Peter and John spoke right back whether it's right. But as for us, there's no question. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. We can't keep quiet. Bob, I was at the hospital when you were supposed to die. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. Can't be quiet about what we've seen and heard. Can't be quiet about what we've seen and heard. So the religious leaders renewed their threats, then released them. They couldn't come up with a charge that would stick, that would keep them in jail. The people wouldn't have stood for it. They were all praising God over what had happened. The man who had been miraculously healed, was over 40 years old. Case closed. Case closed. It's over now. Amen. You get, you get on out of here, Peter and John. Hey, yeah, did you know the rest of the book of Acts? Peter and John is causing havoc everywhere they go. Amen. Still causing trouble. 
Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Hold on just a minute, Joseph. Hold on. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He rescued me. He rescued me. He rescued me. He's so good to me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He rescued you. He healed you. And you're still quiet about it. I need our church to become more evangelistic. I need to remind you that God is a God of movement. That everything he created moves. Amen. We, don't, we can't stay stuck by the gate. We got to get inside and bring our praise. Hallelujah. Everything about us tells us that God will move. And I believe, I, I do not believe that Crosby, Dayton, Channelview, Baytown, Huffman, this area, that this is all we're going to see gospel-wise. I believe that God has more for us in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. I just got to believe that. Come on, give God praise in here one more time. Amen. Amen. Every head up, every eye open just for a moment. Just let me ask you a quick question. If you know, if you know that you know, that you're not for sure that you're going to heaven, lift your hand. I want to pray for you. You don't know, you don't know you're going to heaven. You ain't sure about it. Don't hold your hand up. Let me see it. You're not sure. You're not sure. You're not sure. Okay. I want to make sure you're sure. Okay. Amen. So we're going to pray together. Yes, sir, you're not sure. It's important. This is important. Amen. And I, heads up, eyes open to me. It says that you're bold enough to say, I don't know. Amen. So you two young men, hands back up one more time. I'm going to pray with you, all right? Amen. What's your name, sir? Kyle, you video me on your phone, ma'am. That makes me paranoid. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Tyson. Tyson. Amen. Let's pray for these guys. You guys pray with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my life. Change me. Break every habit, disability, everything that would cause me not to be yours. On this day, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe. Tyson, say, I believe. Channel, say, I believe. That's it. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now guys, listen. Back there, there's a bookstore. Come on, give God praise. It's all good. There's a bookstore back there. They got Bibles. As a matter of fact, if you see something over there in that bookstore and you say, I want that. I don't care if it's a t-shirt, a hoodie, a face mask, a gator. I don't care who. Make sure Cheryl's somebody back here in that bookstore. Amen. If you, a, a tape series. My friend Ken Holloway saying, I don't care what it is. Whatever you want today. Not next week. It's only today. <laughs> don't look over at Keith and say, Keith, what do you want? Uh-uh, this about you. All right? Amen. Today, whatever you want, you get in that bookstore. And then you start. It's, this is such a, an amazing time we live in that we can self-disciple. In other words, I need people to be around me, but I also can find things on. You know, used to you went to the library. I don't go to the library. I just go on the Internet and look at stuff. How do you know the earth went 1,038 mile an hour? I had Katie look it up on the way here. <laughs> Duh. The Internet can't be wrong. Amen. It's validated on more than one website. Now listen, in front of you, there's tithing offer and envelopes. And if you're sitting on the front row, just look toward the guy in the back behind you, and he'll, he'll give you an envelope if you need one. Be a tither. And if you give it on your phone or if you give it online, go to holywild.net slash give. Holywild.net slash give. 
Amen. Just allow God to put you into a place that you understand that giving is a part of your worship. Amen. As I work throughout the week, I remind myself that I am where I am because of the principles and the power of God. I honor God. I don't, it is true what you give, the scripture does say, comes back, pressed down, shaking together, running over. But if that's the reason you give, you're in trouble. Amen. You've got to give to honor God. To honor him. Amen. Honor his house. Hallelujah. His servants in the house. The scripture actually says that, that if I plow in here, that if I preach in here, I should earn my giving from in here. Amen. Or that which keeps me up and keeps me going. So I'm going to give you an announcement. Katie's going to give you an announcement. And then David's going to come. Amen. H, get the buckets ready. You got, if, you, if anybody needs an envelope, lift your hand. But I think they're all in the, in the pews. Amen. We're going to send the buckets around. We're getting back to it. A little bit of normal. Amen. So you ain't got to drop it in the back. We're going to send the buckets around to you. So I will say this, Kim, in the beginning here. So David won't have to. Amen. Everybody got your envelope. You got your phone. Amen. To wave at it. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits. Sales and commission. Checks in the mail. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. Bills paid off. Settlements. Inheritance. Rebates and returns. Debts demolished. Royalties received. Favor and success to the kingdom. Y'all sit back down. Y'all sit back down.